Hello, this is Professor DePaulo. Welcome you back to Abnormal Psychology Psych 260. And today we're going to be talking about one of my favorite topics, which is disorders featuring somatic systems. It used to go under the broad heading of somatization. So I'll use that word kind of interchangeably throughout. So these disorders featuring somatic symptoms include fictitious disorder, which is basically faking it, a version of faking it. Conversion disorder is when you convert uh, psychological trauma into severe physical symptoms, like blindness or paralysis. And there's no organic or biological cause for that, those symptoms. They're purely psychogenic, generated by uh, trauma usually. And then somatic symptom disorder, which is something I personally study used to be known as somatization. And this is when people report physical symptoms, but there's no organic basis. So there's no biological cause for these symptoms. They tend to be psychologically generated and they're very difficult to treat and they're very persistent over time. So these disorders, these disorders featuring somatic symptoms have a lot in common. Uh, they occur in response to severe stress. So the more stress you're under and the less likely you're able to cope with those, those stressors in your life, uh, the more likely you're going to have somatization. Now, what predicts one person to have somatization versus post-traumatic stress disorder versus anxiety disorder? These are probably a genetic vulnerability. And then the stressor or the severe stress that you cannot cope with or adequately cope with is then triggering uh, the disorder, whether that be anxiety, whether that be PTSD, or in this case, uh, somatic uh, related disorders. Uh, they have been traditionally viewed as a form of escape from stress. So you can't deal with your current situation in your life. And these, some, these symptoms that you get are a way of kind of escaping or uh, transforming that poor response to stress into some kind of physical form. And a number of individuals suffer from several of these disorders at once. Uh, and these disorders are very difficult to treat, mainly because the person, the patient that, that's suffering, doesn't view them as psychological. So a lot of times uh, people will go doctor shopping. You know, one doctor says, I don't know what's wrong with you. Uh, I don't know why you have these headaches for, or I don't know why your back hurts. I took the x-ray or I did the test and it came back normal. And so as a patient, you get frustrated. And so then you want to go see, get a second opinion. And the second opinion says, I can't find a reason for your symptoms. Once again, you're frustrated. You think the doctors are incompetent and you go for a third opinion and a fourth opinion. So it becomes known as doctor shopping and it costs a lot of money each year with people that have basically stress-based symptoms or stress-based illness and they're going for all these expensive medical tests and when they get no answers they keep going for more and so it puts a, a very big burden on the healthcare system becomes stressed because of this and uh, it frustrates the patients and it frustrates the doctors alike so these are more complex disorders that are very difficult to treat People with these disorders actually suffer actual changes in their physical function. So their symptoms feel exactly the same as purely organic or medically based symptoms or problems. You can't tell the difference between somatization and something physio physiologically wrong with you, right? Your headaches are really problematic. They cause a lot of pain. They cause a lot of suffering. And you go to the doctor and you're getting minimal relief. Uh, you can't really tell the difference between the headache that's caused by a poor response to stress or overwhelming stress in your life and the headache that's caused by something organic like a brain tumor. I mean, granted, the brain tumor would be really rare and you would see a brain tumor probably on an MRI and definitely on a PET scan. Uh, you know, it feels the same. It feels you're, you're just in pain or you have migraine. Migraine is a physiological condition but it's exacerbated, it's made so much worse by stress and poor coping abilities. 
and so your migraines are out of control and it's not that there's something tremendously physiologically wrong with you right there's not there's not it's not a brain tumor it's not uh, some kind of problem with your spinal cord where you're having you know a, uh, a headache due to like a spinal cord leak or something like that it, it's, it's actually stress in your life that is just exacerbating or making the headache problem much worse now there's a variety of other factors as well that go into it but stress is a huge player in this right it's a huge cause of a lot of these physical conditions that we have no explanation for or we have a poor explanation for and so the goal of treatment is to get the patient to basically acknowledge that, you know, this is stress-based, psychologically based, and then to make changes in their life to sort of attenuate the symptoms. But that's difficult because when the patient thinks it's a medical problem that's been missed by all these doctors, it's very difficult to convince them that it's a psychologically based symptom. Now, it's always possible that the diagnosis is a mistake and that the patient's problem has an organic cause. So as a physician, you want to rule out all the possible medical causes. That's why if you have unexplained headaches, you're going to get that MRI of the brain to make sure that there's nothing serious going on. And if it comes back clean, it's either migraine or stress headache, which is basically a somatization, right? There's no real treatment other than your basic uh, anti-inflammatories they could try migraine based drugs but even those are hit or miss they don't work for everybody but you want to rule out the medical cause so you have to get the test done the problem is that if you're suffering with these stress-based disorders you're having test after test and they're all coming back negative where do you draw the line do you keep going from doctor to doctor getting the same test run well some people do and that's a big waste of time, energy, money, toll on the healthcare system, right? Toll on your own well-being, because while you're, you know, out searching for the cure for your disorder, uh, you're you're really stressed and anxious about it. You're not sleeping. You're thinking about it all the time, uh, and that leads to other somatic-based anxieties and issues down the line. So, uh, it's very very challenging a set of disorders to treat. So I'm going to start with fictitious disorder, which is otherwise known as Munchausen syndrome. And you're probably familiar with the idea of Munchausen by proxy, which is when parents make up symptoms in their children. So the child plays a sick role. If it's just regular fictitious disorder or Munchausen syndrome, uh, the patient is the one that's sick, but they're faking it. They're faking illness for attention, for sympathy. There's some kind of behavioral reward that they're getting for faking an illness. Maybe they're in a bad marriage and by faking an illness, their spouse actually pays attention to them and they feel better about their marriage that way and that reinforces uh, this faking syn you know, syndrome, right? This fictitious disorder. Or in a lot of times, uh, mothers induce generally mothers because it's not really seen what fathers are doing this the vast vast majority of munchausen, munchausen by proxy is mothers inducing fake ailments in their children you know sending their children for exploratory surgeries because they're saying that the child is hurt the child is in pain the child is suffering and they may manipulate the child in as fact is they may actually go and poison the child slowly to make the child throw up and to make the child seem ill. That has happened before where the mother has either given medication to make, make their own child sick or you know when the child is in the hospital, get, put things in the child's IV to make the child do poorly in the hospital, uh, mainly because they they get reinforced by their child being sick, probably through the attention they get and the sympathy they get. Oh, I feel so sorry. How, how could you deal with a sick child? You know, um, let me help you with this. You know, I, I feel so terribly for you. You're, you're really suffering. And that sympathy, that, you know, comfort that, that is natural to many of, many of us, you see someone that's struggling and they have a problem with their, with their own child. You feel terribly about it. 
and so you feel a lot of sympathy for that that mother or that parent but it, in fact you're reinforcing their behavior if they have munchausen by proxy so now you're you're doing what they want you to do this is why they're you know in some cases poisoning their own child making their child intentionally sick to get the attention to get the sympathy right now in the case that you're faking illness for money only or somehow to manipulate something that you have to do for example you fake an illness to uh, avoid being enlisted in the military so during the draft uh, many people would fake illnesses right i can't be drafted because i have a bad hip look i'm limping I'm suffering I'm in pain how could I be drafted if I'm in such so, so severe pain I'm useless why would you want me to be in the the military that would be called malingering so you're faking the illness for an external reward whether that be you don't have to be drafted into the military which has happened before whether that be um, you're collecting disability or uh, accidental insurance right from your your work your job or you know you're getting some money in a lawsuit so you're faking an injury for the money that's malingering that's a lot different than fictitious disorder fictitious disorder which is Munchausen syndrome and also Munchausen by proxy is when you fake for some kind of psychological reward it's not an external reward malingering is the external reward this is an internal reward this is attention sympathy you want to play the sick role the sick role by itself is reinforcing probably due to the fact that you're getting attention from other people that you probably haven't gotten before and I think that's what you're seeing a lot of times with the mothers that are making their own child sick is the mothers relish the attention they're probably not getting that attention in their marriage or their relationships or their job you know and maybe they don't have a job maybe they're they're um, taking care of children full-time and this is the attention that they're getting right they're they're starved they're they're or they're overwhelmed they need people to help them so they fake illness in their child rather than rather than themselves because it's a lot more sympathy generated by having an illness in your child than having an illness in yourself I mean, people will feel sorry for you but with a child it's like oh that's so horrible let me help you in x y and z ways and I think that's kind of reinforcing to the person that that's suffering from my child so by proxy and they hide it very well and so you'll be seeing some clips on on this stuff that I'm going to post for you it, it, it's really interesting but it's also extremely frightening and scary and it's criminal it's a criminal offense to basically make your child sick on purpose for some you know attention or other reward that you're getting by your child playing the sick you know being in the sick role so it's a severe illness and it's very difficult to treat it's very difficult to even identify so the precise causes for a fictitious disorder are not understood although it could be depression it could be unsupported parental relationships during childhood parents didn't show you attention during childhood so now you're faking the sick role to get attention from other people in your life right uh, a need for social support you feel like no one's helping you so if you're sick you're going to get help people are going to be friendly to you they're going to talk to you they're going to feel bad for you and some people like when others feel bad for them and because they, they get more attention now that's just fictitious disorder that can happen with fictitious disorder by proxy as well there are not really effective treatments for fictitious disorder or or Munchausen by proxy either uh, just you know another reminder there's no external reward so there's not money's not involved for faking symptoms if there's money involved or any kind of external reward it's called malingering like avoiding the draft back when there was a draft right uh, people fake illness for that it would be malingering but if you're just trying to play the sick role it's going to be Munchausen and if it's in your child it's going to be Munchausen by proxy now let's move on to conversion disorder uh, conversion disorder is a severe neurological deficit that occurs due to stress or trauma 
in a person's life, overwhelming trauma. For example, uh, someone may end up after a trauma being paralyzed. They can't walk. Now that's a serious symptom. So they go to the doctor, they get all the tests run, and the doctors say, there's nothing wrong with your spinal cord, there's nothing wrong with your legs, there's nothing wrong with your brain. So we have no explanation for your paralysis. Or there could be blindness, right? So you've heard the term hysterical blindness, that would be conversion disorder, where the person has such an overwhelming stressful experience that they actually lose vision in one or both eyes. And once again, they go to the doctor, they check for optic nerve damage, right? They check for brain damage, occipital lobe damage. Nothing's wrong, nothing's wrong with brain, nothing's wrong with optic nerve or the eye itself. And so the doctor says, I can't explain it. It's gotta be conversion disorder, some kind of an intense stressful experience. You could not cope with it and you transformed it into a neurological symptom. So conversion disorder is usually a severe neurological symptom. Think paralysis, blindness, loss of feeling, something something severe and neurological. And it, there's no organic basis. This generally occurs between late childhood and young adulthood. It's also diagnosed in women twice as much as men, but so is basically every other disorder. For the most part, uh, that's because women actually seek treatment, or as men don't. So I don't really read too much into that. And they usually appear suddenly. So conversion disorder is something that happens really fast. It's also extremely, extremely rare. It's much rarer than fictitious disorder. It's much rarer than uh, somat somatization, which I'll talk about later, which is somatic symptom disorder now. Uh, this is a severe neurological deficit that has no organic or biological or neurological basis, right? It's purely psychological. And why someone develops this versus PTSD, once again, we don't know. Could be genetic markers that get triggered during extreme stressful uh, situations. But we really don't know exactly what's triggering this disorder. So conversion disorders are often similar to real medical problems. Um, and doctors have to really examine the patient to determine that they're not medically caused, right? So there's one thing that's very common among conversion disorder patients that medically doesn't make sense, and that's called the glove anesthesia. So glove anesthesia is when the entire hand is basically paralyzed. You have no feeling in your hand at all. Now that makes very little sense because if you had some kind of nerve damage that caused lack of feeling or paralysis in your hand, it would not sort of take over your entire hand unilaterally. And the reason that's the case is there's there's two major nerves that go into the hand, the ulnar nerve and the radial nerve. And if one of those nerves is damaged, it will affect part of your hand and not the other part. And to have both of those nerves damaged at once, at the, you know, equally, right, to cause universal uh, consistent anesthesia of the hand is extremely unlikely. Even people that have severe hand injuries do not have this whole glove uniform anesthesia of the hand. So once the doctors do the examination, they know how the human body works, they know how the nerves map out, uh, they can tell right away that this is not consistent with a medical cause. And there's nothing wrong with the nerve. And they can do nerve testing to confirm that there's nothing wrong with the nerves. You know, my hand is paralyzed. I have no feeling in my hand. Something's wrong. I can't move my hand. Physiologically, there's nothing wrong with your hand. It doesn't make sense for your entire hand to be to feel this way at one time. So this is these are things that kind of tip off uh, medical doctors to realize, or neurologists in general, to, to make them realize this is not medical. This is psychological. But a lot of times conversion disorders, I mean, they're very rare to begin with they're hard to really tell exactly what's going on there, right? It's hard to convince people that you're paralyzed in your leg or your hand because of some psychological problem. That's something that people kind of resist when they hear this. It doesn't make sense. So remember I talked about doctor shopping, 
that's going to happen in conversion disorder. The reason why you don't see it as much is because conversion disorder is really rare. I mean, it's much less than 1% of the population in terms of the incidence um, of the disorder, right? So you don't see many new cases. You don't see many existing cases out there. It's extremely rare. But when you do see it, you're going to have just a lot of people shaking their heads confused. Uh, you know, it's, there's no organic basis. So therefore, it has to be a conversion disorder. It's kind of a disorder of exclusion. And the other thing about conversion disorder is it generally goes away. So, you know, you're paralyzed. Let's say you're paralyzed, both of your legs are paralyzed from a conversion disorder. You can't walk, you can't move. And then all of a sudden, one day you wake up and you're back to normal. And there's no rhyme or reason. It can, it can resolve spontaneously. Treating it psychologically, you know, may be helpful, possibly, but a lot of times it's not helpful, right? I mean, like going back and examining the trauma and why it was, you know, why it was converted to begin with. And this all ties back to Freud's belief that emotional symptoms can manifest themselves as physical symptoms. And that's one thing about Freud that I, that I agree with. I mean, I don't agree with a lot, but that's one thing I do, definitely do agree with. Uh, and in some prone individuals, emotional trauma, psychological damage, harm, problems in general, if they're severe enough, can manifest themselves in terms of a severe neurological deficit. And that would be called conversion disorder. Now, the disorder that I mainly study out of these three is called somatization or more technically now in the DSM-5, it's called somatic symptom disorder. And people with somatic symptom disorder become excessively distressed, concerned, and anxious about their bodily symptoms that they're experiencing. And they're worried about them, right? They're, they're having these physical symptoms that are troublesome and there's no organic basis. So trips to the doctor don't help. And it's just kind of a big question mark. Why am I having these headaches or these stomach aches or these back aches? Why am I having this? I don't know. It could be that you're under a lot of stress and you're converting it into physical symptoms. Now, this is much less severe than conversion disorder. Conversion disorder is a major neurological deficit that occurs because of a emotional slash psychological trauma. Somatization is much more subtle. It's a, it's a much more mild version of physical symptoms, like stomach ache is a very common one. You know how many stomach aches people have and there's really no explanation for it? All right. A lot of times it's just emotions, stressors that you're not dealing with appropriately and they're getting converted into physical symptoms. One person gets a stomach ache, another person gets a headache, another person gets a backache, right, etc. But they're very distressing and they can really, they can cause disability in some populations. If you have severe somatization, it can be disabling where people can't go to work. They're in too much pain. They're suffering. They're just, uh, they don't want to socialize. They don't want to go out. They don't want to do anything. They're just basically ruled by their somatic complaints. So it can get serious, but it doesn't turn neurological like in the conversion disorder. In many cases, symptoms of somatization have no known cause, and the treatment is very difficult. It's very difficult to go back and, and find what the root of the problem is. And antidepressants, they can help somewhat, but they're not, a, they're not really intended to treat somatization. And somatization is kind of one of these things that it's happening all the time, and people kind of just ignore it. It bothers them. They're suffering, but... They kind of like learn to live with it because no one can really diagnose them. No one's giving them effective treatments. Uh, they may not even mention it to their psychotherapist because they, they don't understand that my headache or stomach it can be psychologically based. They just don't know this. And so these disorders kind of, you know, they get bucketed, they get labeled irritable bowel syndrome, right? Or chronic head, uh, tension headache. These are just labels. These don't mean anything, right? Um, there's all kinds of prostodynia, which is uh, 
prostate related inflammation that has no organic basis uh, and you can even push it out even further if i wanted to say uh, irritable bowel syndrome is a lot of somatization right uh, if i wanted to say that fibromyalgia has a heavy component of somatization i'm not going to say that there is no medical basis for anything because there's a medical basis for everything right but if you're looking for the major cause of the disorder, it's not medical. I mean, if you look at fibromyalgia, it's a disorder where predominantly in women, where they have pain in all four quadrants of their body. And sometimes the pain is very intense, uh, extreme muscle spasm, feeling of pain, burning sensation, difficulty sleeping. So it's a complex of these these symptoms that just kind of have no organic basis, right? Uh, the causes that the central nervous system is overactive. What does that mean? That's not that's not a cause. That's just that's the cause when a doctor says, we don't know what the cause is. We think there's some sensitization of the nervous system. Really? <laughs> How? What does that mean? It's not a diagnosis. What's the treatment? Oh, antidepressants, muscle relaxers. Really? That's a non-specific treatment. That's given to anybody that has vague pain in their body, right? So there's no real medical explanation. They may invent something to make themselves feel better, but there is a large psychological component that a lot of people are not treating. And that's making the somatization, whether that be stomach aches with ear old bowel syndrome, which is once again, uh, a functional disorder. There's no organic cause. The, the, intent, the intestine, the large intestine is sensitive. What does that mean again? <laughs> That's, you know, I mean, maybe it does have to do with serotonin and stuff, but so does depression, so does anxiety. That, that's all based on neurotransmitters, but what are the neurotransmitters based on? It's based on psychological symptoms, stressors, emotions that are not processed, that are not dealt with. And that's what's leading to the disorder. And until the medical field and the psychological field can integrate and become partners, these kind of disorders will not be treated effectively. Right now, it's mostly the medical field dealing with these problems, and they're not dealing with them in a productive manner. They're just kind of assigning a label to them and saying, you have this disorder, it's chronic. You have irritable bowel syndrome. You have a chronic stomach ache. We don't know exactly what the cause is. Stress makes it worse. Okay, well, right there, stress makes it worse. What does that sound like? Emotional stressors, psychological factors that are not adequately dealt with causing physical symptoms. The treatment is almost always psychological, but it's hard to get people to acknowledge that their physical complaints that they've been living with for years are psychologically based. And the medical community has no treatments for them. So that's the, that's the real conundrum we face with uh, somatic symptom disorder, somatization, is that these things linger for years and years, entire lives for some people, and they're not getting effective treatment, both medically, because doctors don't know what the effective treatment is, and psychologically, because patients don't realize that their symptoms can be psychological in origin. Here's the uh, DSM-5 checklist. For somatization, you have to have at least one physical symptom that occurs repeatedly, disrupts your, you know, your life in some way, and you need to think about it most of the time. Uh, you have anxiety built around it. You spend a lot of energy dealing with it, right? And it lasts for at least six months. So these, um, the diagnostic criteria change a little bit. Uh, it's focusing more on the anxiety part here, whereas the previous uh, diagnostic criteria for somatization, which is now somatic symptom disorder, used to be focused on the physical symptom having no organic basis. Here, it's just mainly about your, your thinking about it, which you do, right? Uh, but this also sort of bleeds into uh, hypochondriasis a little bit here, right? It's, 
there's some overlap with this, uh, what they call now illness anxiety disorder or hypochondriasis, worried about a medical condition that may not be there. So there's a little bit of overflow here, which I don't really think is appropriate, but this is the way they've changed the, the diagnostic setup. It has to last for at least six months. But the way I view somatization is how it always has been classically viewed, physical symptoms with no organic basis. And of course you're worried about them. Of course they're upsetting. That comes with the territory. That's all natural. Um, so I, I kind of, I'm not a big fan of how they revised it, but this is how they revised it. And as I mentioned before, this is a long lasting problem, somatization. It used to be known as uh, Briquet syndrome. And it in includes headaches, gastrointestinal difficulties, generalized pain throughout the body or specific areas of the body. Sexual dysfunction can be tied into this. Neurological symptoms, big neurological symptoms can be tied in with somatization. And doctor shock, going from doctor to doctor, looking for an answer and getting none and getting frustrated and just keep going doctor shopping. Predominant pain pattern is a pain disorder uh, where you have some kind of injury or some kind of uh, real general medical condition that causes the pain. So it could be an accident or an illness that caused gen genuine pain, but then the pain lasts more than it should, right? So, you know, the injury has healed, but the pain continues and the pain is not proportionate to where the injury is. So this happens a lot of times after surgery. Uh, someone's in severe pain after surgery. They're giving painkillers to treat the pain. They're only giving those painkillers for a couple weeks, really. Maybe even less now because of the huge uh, pushback against uh, opiates in this country. But they're given pain, painkillers, and all of a sudden they, the injury heals, right? So you get the follow-up appointment, the surgery went well, the wound is better, there's no sign of injury but you're still in pain. And so then this is long lasting pain uh, can be considered predominant pain pattern. It could also occur with an accident. You were in a car accident, your injuries healed, uh, but you're still in this you know, state of pain. You have this chronic pain and uh, doctors don't know what the basis of the pain is. And the pain can actually be psychological that there is some kind of trauma that you haven't resolved based on the, the accident or the illness and that's you know feeding into the pain and making it worse and the problem with the, these uh, somatization leading to pain disorder is that if you keep treating the pain disorder with opiates you're not effectively treating anything right because opiates are just a stopgap you can't treat long term with opiate to get opiates to get a, a good result so then the person becomes hooked on opiates. And there's also evidence to suggest that if you take opiates, opiates are, you know, the opiate uh, binding painkillers, right? So morphine, you know, and then you have uh, your Percocet, you have your Vicodin, you have your Demerol, Dilaudid, you know, um, you keep going up the chain, you'll have eventually, um, you, know, more, you know, morphine, obviously, and then recreationally you have heroin and then both um, and heroin is extremely dangerous it's an extremely potent pain reliever extremely potent opiate so it leads to addiction and overdose a lot of times right so the whole goal is to get people off of these opiate medicines um, especially if they have a, a surgery or an injury just give it very short term wean them off as fast as possible so they don't develop tolerance and withdrawal effects and eventually addiction, right? Um, but so pain, pain management in this country is just kind of in a bad place right now. Uh, whether the pain is psychologically driven, which is the case with pain disorder, whether it's legitimate physical pain due to injury, uh, it's not being treated effectively. So people in chronic pain are going on and on for years with inadequately treated pain because of the whole opiate epidemic, which is a very real epidemic. I'm not downplaying the seriousness of the opiate epidemic, but 
at the same time there are a lot of people that need pain management for chronic injury and they're not getting enough pain management they're, they were getting okay tolerable pain management before but with the drug enforcement agency the dea cracking down on opiates they're getting very poor pain management currently so um, there ha there has to be a lot of work towards the psychological aspect of pain as well because the psychological aspect of pain feeds into the chronic pain syndrome and we need to do a better job addressing that component and that, that component is not addressed very well whether that's through uh, dbt dialectical behavioral therapy mindfulness techniques um, whether it's through uh, working through trauma psychologically that will all help to decrease pain in most patients really Cognitive behavioral therapy for pain is a specific therapy to help reduce chronic pain. That should be used in conjunction with any other medications that the patient is on. So what causes conversion and somatic symptom disorders? These used to be called hysterical, hysterical disorders, and they used to be diagnosed predominantly in women. There was a lot of bias towards uh, diagnosing hysteria in women. No explanation for these disorders have gotten much research support. So there's a variety of different theories out there, but there's nothing that's a legitimate treatment option that's been proven. There's data based on it and said, this is the technique that works for somatization, works for conversion disorder or fictitious disorder. There's really not many good options. It's easier to treat somatization because it's a less serious disorder Conversion disorder responds pretty, you know, sometimes it responds completely spontaneously. So you don't have to do anything and the person's uh, will respond. Sometimes they don't. Sometimes conver conversion disorder can be long lasting. It doesn't respond spontaneously. So why certain people resolve quickly and other people don't, that's something we need to look into also. And fictitious disorder, it's all about reinforcement. At least that's my opinion. Uh, but we don't really know what that we're actually reinforcing the person that's showing the fictitious disorder because we're not certain that they're actually faking. We, we believe people. If people say, I have this problem, you don't just look at them and say, you're lying, you're faking it. We tend to believe people, especially if they complain of sickness and illness. It's very difficult to, to really, to, you know, to not believe someone and, and kind of confront them over it. But in the case of the fictitious disorder, that's what needs to be done. So let's look at the psychodynamic view. So Freud believed that these disorders represented conversion of emotional conflict into physical symptoms. And most of his patients were women at the time. So Freud centered his explanation on the psychosexual development of girls and focused on the phallic stage, which is, you know, in, in boys, this is involved with the edible complex that you're familiar with. In the case of girls, he focused that there was a problem during the phallic stage, age three to five in girls, and he called this the electrocomplex. So girls develop a sexual desire for their father and recognize their mother as a rival. They have to compete with their mother for the attention of, of their father, right? But the mother is more powerful, so girls then repress these sexual feelings and convert them into physical symptoms. So basically Freud believed that this electro complex early in life, that where the mother is seen as a rival and the physical affection for the father, that's not appropriate. So it gets converted into physical symptoms later in life. So this event that occurs, you know, you don't remember this event because it's been repressed. That means it's been pushed into the unconscious. So you have no idea it even happened. But Freud would believe that all girls go through this, and this is the leading candidate for the explanation of somatization. And women just so happen to report more physical symptoms, so this, this electro complex has got to be the key component for this, according to Freud. Behaviorists take a little more nuanced view of somatization and even a fictitious disorder. And I gave you my explanation for a fictitious disorder. It's all reinforcement from my point of view, that the reason why someone has fictitious or Munchausen syndrome is the same thing, right? 
same different names, same disease, same disorder, is because they're getting reinforced somehow. They're getting some kind of reinforcement from family members, spouses, significant others, other relatives, their friends, the general public, etc. There's some kind of reinforcement going on there, uh, which is the, what's kind of reinforcing the faking, the fake symptoms, making up the symptoms. So, like I said, you know, bad marriage. The you know, a woman in a bad marriage, because it's predominantly women. You don't see Munchausen by proxy with men. It's it's almost entirely women. In this situation, a woman's in a bad marriage, and she may not be getting what she desires from her partner, her spouse. She's not getting any attention. She's tied up in the lives of her children, and she sees the child as a, as a means of grabbing some attention that she hasn't gotten. Maybe she's completely ignored at home. And so now the child has symptoms, whether they're induced by the mother. A lot of times they are. So the mother feeds the child and puts something in the food that may give the child an upset stomach or cause vomiting or cause diarrhea or cause the child to be sick. And this is happening over and over and over again, right? The child is sick. The child doesn't understand why, why he or she is sick, right? Who would think that my own mother would be poisoning me or doing something in a way that leads me to suffer like this? So they go from doctor to doctor, and the doctor says, I don't understand what's wrong. I don't understand why your child is vomiting constantly. Um, uh, sometimes they pick up on the, the drug, you know, sometimes they pick up the drugs in the urine, but a lot of times they don't because the drug doesn't stay in the system, in your system for that long. And so the urine test does not always get sensitive to picking up the drug, right? So if you know you're having a doctor's appointment coming up in two weeks, maybe you don't induce you know the illness in your child and so the so the urine test comes back clean and now the urine test is done now the mother figures i can now induce illness in my child again because they're not going to have another urine test and so my child is still suffering urine test comes back fine blood test comes back fine why is my child suffering i'm so worried about my child at that point the mother is getting attention from other people the spouse who never pays attention says, wow, my child is sick. I'm, I'm really concerned. Now I need to be more involved. And this is really hard on you. The friends, the family that might have been critical of the mother at some point, they're all on board. They're all super supportive, sympathetic, helping. And so this is rewarding in some way. Bringing attention from people, bringing awards, um, rewards from people, right? Could be even in, they don't do it for financial considerations because that would be malingering if they did. But I mean, it could bring some some uh, financial help as well. But that's not the primary motive here. The primary motive is attention from somebody else, the family, friends, the general public, etc. These are these are really uh, some of them become such high profile cases. They're on TV, and now you're getting attention from millions of people watching you on TV. You know, no one's ever heard of you, but now your child's sick all the time. They can't figure it out. So now you're on some talk show, you know, some mid-afternoon talk show. And everybody's here. Everyone knows you. You're, you're a TV star now. You're famous. And people around the world are looking at you and, you know, saying, wow, that's amazing. How does she deal with that? That's, that's so difficult. I feel so bad for her. Like, they know who you are. You're getting a lot of reinforcement there, right? Uh, and there's, there's something called secondary gain. The secondary gain is a reinforcer that you're not aware of that continues a problematic behavior. In this case, the secondary gain could be the attention, that maybe they didn't seek the attention immediately, they're getting the attention, they like it. Right? Let's say you're, you have, um, let's say you personally are faking an illness, so you have Munchausen syndrome, and you're sick all the time, but you're faking it, right? You're calling out sick for work. You're telling your friends you're always sick. Well, what do they do? They help you out, right? So I'm, I'm too weak to go grocery shopping. You, you know, your friend says, I'm going to go grocery shopping. Oh, I haven't been working. I don't have, you know, I don't really have the funds. Okay, I'm going to pay for it. Don't worry about it. I'm going to help you out. 
that feels pretty good for the person that's feigning the sick, you know, playing the sick role, right? They're getting, now they're getting attention. They're getting people saying they're sorry for them. Um, in the case of a bad marriage, once again, if you feign illness, maybe you're less likely to get divorced. If you're trying to avoid a divorce, you know, this might be one way of faking an illness to avoid the divorce or to, to avoid a breakup of some kind. So these are, this is all called secondary gain. So it's, it's more subtle. It's like behind the scenes, but it's reinforcing the problematic behavior. Uh, and you see this with depression as well. You know, I'm depressed. Well, I can't help it. I'm depressed. It's biological. But it's also, you're also being reinforced sometimes for being depressed, because maybe if you're depressed, um, someone's going to pay your rent, or someone's going to help you out in some way, and you're not going to want to, you know, you're not going to want to get a job afterwards. So you're just going to keep being depressed, because being depressed means people have to help you, and you don't have to take any responsibility on. So that can happen a lot of times, you know, with people that they're going to maintain this this dysfunctional behavior because they're getting rewarded in some way, uh, you know, that wasn't intended, right? And that reward reinforces the behavior. Even though the behavior is bad, uh, it gets reinforced. Whether it's genuine or not, let's say it's genuine depression, part of the reason why people maintain depression could be behaviorally through secondary gain or getting some kind of reinforcer. In the case of Munchausen, there's definitely some kind of reinforcer happening there. Um, that's that's boosting the behavior in terms of conversion disorder it's a little less it's a little less clear what's going on there i mean you know they're getting reinforced somehow through attention in some way uh, but these are more severe symptoms that are harder to fake i mean it's hard to fake blindness or paralysis this is something that cannot easily be faked so we have to be somewhat skeptical of conversion disorder but there is enough cases to suggest that, it, that this is something that's genuine, that it's not something that's completely fabricated. Uh, but a lot of times the, these symptoms or these disorders get uh, reinforced uh, through unexpected ways, through positive reinforcement from other people involved. A multicultural view of somatization says that Western clinicians have a bias against physical symptoms. Right, so they see physical symptoms as something that's inferior, something that's bad, because you're not coping, right? You're not coping with the stress in your life, you have physical symptoms, that means you're weak in some way. This is a maladaptive process, this is a problematic process. Whereas Eastern cultures see it a lot differently. So they see it more as normal. Uh, for example, if you look in Asian cultures, Asian cultures are extremely negative against depression. So in Asian cultures, the level of depression reported and diagnosed is extremely low because there's a stigma more against the diagnosis of depression. However, the rates of somatization are very high in Asian cultures. So this is the West-East uh, discord, right? The West is, the Western culture is individualistic. The Eastern culture is collectivistic. So it's about the group, the family, shared uh, responsibility, whereas Western culture, U.S. culture is all I, individualist, right? So in Eastern cultures, depression is seen as a negative because it probably reflects poorly on the whole family, the whole group. So not just you, but your whole, your, your relatives, your relationships, because that's how Eastern culture looks at things. Uh, but somatization is seen as much more acceptable, whereas in Western culture, somatization is seen as dysfunctional, right? Something that should be changed, something that needs to be addressed. Um, it's just a different view of things. It's, it's the, the perception of depression in Eastern cultures is very, very negative. It's, it's something that's not even diagnosed very often. They'd rather, they'd much rather diagnose you as having somatization. And the reason why is because somatization is a physical illness. So they're not saying anything about your psychological symptoms. It's a physical symptom. It's something physical, we can treat it. It's a medical problem. That's okay in Eastern cultures, in Asian cultures. It's okay to have a medical problem. So is a medical problem. We know that it's not. We know that it's a physical symptom caused by a psychological problem, right? But you can easily say that's a medical problem if your culture rejects 
psychological difficulties. And that's what's happening in Eastern cultures. So depression is a psychological problem that's seen as being much worse uh, in that culture, in the Eastern culture, than somatization, which can be looked at as a medical problem. So you see a West versus East difference in terms of how you interpret somatization and related disorders. Treatments, uh, a lot of times it's trauma, emotional difficulty. So some of the treatment that applies to PTSD, which is exposure, right? Prolonged exposure treatments. So go back and think about the traumatic event. And the more you do that, you work on sort of reprocessing the traumatic event, the less intensive the symptoms are gonna be. So that's one particular way to look at somatization. These are symptoms that develop due to emotional disturbance or trauma. So we need to go back and sort of process the trauma like we do with PTSD, treat it almost like PTSD. Uh, drug therapy, not too effective. Uh, some antidepressants are given for chronic pain. Tricyclics are very useful for chronic pain, tricyclic antidepressants. Um, so whether that's stomach pain or headaches can help with, if the headaches are migraines, obviously uh, migraine related drugs can be given for that. There's a whole variety of treatments for migraine. Uh, I'm not saying that migraine is somatization. What I'm saying is that migraine severity is very much influenced by emotional difficulties. And so treating those emotional difficulties is going to really treat the migraine much of the time. Uh, but yeah, migraine can be influenced by foods, by weather patterns, by hormonal changes. I mean, there's lots of factors. Uh, it's a really difficult thing to treat, but stress headaches, tension headaches can be treated through therapies like if it's trauma-based, uh, do the same exposure therapies. Drug therapies, yeah, like I said, not, not too effective. Can help a little bit with pain. Tricyclics are useful. Um, if there's anxiety and depression, you could try SSRI drugs. Uh, SNRI drugs are useful for pain too. The norepinephrine is specifically useful for pain. So things like um, you know, back pain, the SNRI drugs like Cymbalta would be very useful for chronic back pain, chronic headache in some cases, uh, but it's difficult. There's a lot of people that have headaches. Headaches is one of the hardest things to treat because it can be both psychological and physiological and you gotta kind of treat both. But there's a big psychological component, that's why I bring it up. But drug therapy, overall, not too effective. The treatments for these things are, are difficult. So it's, there's no one guaranteed way to proceed. Uh, some other therapies could involve uh, suggested techniques, which is hypnosis. I'm a strong believer in hypnosis when it comes to pain regulation. Hypnosis is very good for dealing with pain. So if there's a pain component, I'm definitely in favor of hypnosis. Uh, obviously, reinforcement. So you need to change the reward structures. A lot of this is secondary gain. So you need to identify, is there secondary gain? Are you being reinforced? Is this problematic behavior being reinforced without even you knowing it? Change the reward structure. So in the case of fictitious disorder, uh, unfortunately, the best treatment is separation. Because most, most cases end up uh, being child abuse. So the child has to be separated if it's Munchausen by proxy. The child has to be separated from the mother. Um, and that's the best way to, to fix that disorder. The mother's behavior will go back to normal because there's no reinforcement anymore with the child. And the child obviously will, will not be sick anymore because the mother is making the child sick. So this is really an important thing. That's one of the, the cues they look for if a child's in a hospital, they'll separate the child from the mother for a period of time to see if the child bounces back. And that could be a, a red flag. Child's getting a lot better. Child's in a hospital, mother never saw the child. Child's better now. So how's the child sick at home and better in the hospital? That's a red flag right there because the mother's making the child sick. So um, that's generally uh, separation of child from mother. Mother goes to jail child is you know needs to go for therapy but um the child generally bounces back pretty well from that
and the mother obviously will no longer have the Munchausen because the child's no longer there. Or you can try confrontation. This is generally not a good idea, uh, confronting someone for playing the sick role. So if you had someone that you were close with, a family member or a close friend, you can then try to confront them about why they're being sick. What are they getting out of this? Why they're faking their illness? I, I don't see this as you know a generally positive strategy because the person will get very defensive and just kind of, they're not going to, to work at trying to resolve their problems this way. Uh, there's generally a, a defensiveness that will kick in here that will basically end this as any kind of therapeutic technique, right? Um, you know, I'm not a big fan of confronting the person over it, but I mean, it can happen. They do this in, with uh, people that have drug problems and alcohol problems as well. Sometimes it, it can be somewhat helpful. A lot of times it backfires. So I'm not too thrilled about the confrontation scenario. But the bottom line is we really don't know. I mean, there's a lot of different things to think about. There's no one proven strategy for treating these somatic uh, related disorders. It's just, these are very difficult disorders to treat. And I wish I could say DBT. I mean, DBT is gonna be useful, dialectical behavioral therapy. Uh, I think it's helpful for a lot of these things, but it's not, you know, it's not the silver bullet that fixes things, right? You could, you could meditate, you know, for a long time with uh, conversion disorder. It doesn't mean you're going to all of a sudden neurologically be 100%, right? I mean, meditation can help help with the physiological symptoms, even if they're psychologically generated. But uh, is it the one sort of guaranteed cure? There's not a lot of data on it. So I think we need to find better ways to treat somatization, which is, you know, one of my main research interests is looking at, you know, what are the characteristics that predict somatization and how can, based on those characteristics, how can we then target an intervention? And so right now we're thinking about things like journaling as an intervention, uh, which is helpful. I mean, we're looking at meditation, which is helpful. Uh, but we're also looking at things that happen early in life, like attachment style. So certain attachment styles are more prone to somatization. And that's a, a relationship that, that happens, something that's determined very early in life at one year of age when they test it in the lab, right? So that goes back to a more psychoanalytic approach that it's the relationship between the child and the mother that sets one on a path towards these somatic disorders. So maybe we have to sort of target that. That could be hypnosis, but I don't know how effective that is. That That's straight out of psychoanalysis. So we're talking about years and years of therapy if you're gonna go that route. Uh, moving on to a related disorder, we have illness anxiety disorder, which used to be known as hypochondriasis. This is when people exaggerate their bodily symptoms as signs of a serious illness. So they scan their body, they look for symptoms, and then they interpret them as dangerous. And we're seeing a lot of those in, in today's society. We're seeing a, we're going to see a lot of this, right? So you have a cough, and now you're disasterizing. Something seriously wrong. You know, I have a serious illness. I'm going to die, right? But most of the time, the symptom is benign. You know, I feel I have a headache, so that means I must have a brain tumor. No, it doesn't. It doesn't mean you have a brain tumor. A brain tumor is a very low probability event. Even if you're getting older, a brain tum tumor is a low probability event. There's a lot of other things that are, you know, a much better explanation, even without the imaging, even without the MRI of your of your brain. Uh, right? So, you know, could it be migraine? Could it be tension headache? Of course. There's a variety of different headaches that are not related to brain tumor. But someone with illness anxiety disorder is going to go right to brain tumor. I have cancer. I have a horrible illness. I'm going to die. And so they worry, they worry, they worry about these concerns. And that leads to, once again, doctor shopping, not believing the, the doctor's diagnosis. How do you know this? I think it's cancer. You know, how do you know it's not cancer? 
right? That leads to excessive medical testing. So your, your doctor is going to say, I, you know, your symptoms are not consistent with any known form of cancer. Your blood work is not consistent with cancer. So we don't think it's cancer. Why are you talking about cancer? Well, I need an MRI to make sure. So now you, you're pushing for an MRI as the patient. And the MRI is going to cost you thousands of dollars or cost your insurance company thousands of dollars. And, you know, you're doing this because you're so paranoid that this fairly benign symptom, according to your, the doctors you're seeing, is a disaster, like cancer. And then you get that test back and it's not cancer. And then temporarily you may be relieved and now you, then you move on to something else, right? So you're disasterizing. It's a, it's a purely cognitive phenomenon. You're labeling your symptom, disasterizing, looking for the worst case scenario. And then that goes with doctor shopping, that goes with increased medical expenses. Uh, and these people are very difficult to treat because no matter how much reassuring you give them, they are still worried that you miss something and that there is something disastrously, disastrously wrong with them or going to happen to them in a short period of time. So the person's preoccupied with thoughts of having a significant illness. In fact, the, the, the symptoms are generally benign. They have an extremely high level of health anxiety and um, they will, they're hypervigilant with regard to bodily symptoms. So they're scanning their body for any kind of symptom that's slightly abnormal. Like my heart's beating a little faster than it usually does. So I must have something wrong with my heart. Uh, there will be doctor shopping with these people, but there will also be a subset of people that avoid doctors. So this is another one where um, if the person is super anxious about their disorder, there is a subset of these patients that will just completely avoid doctors because the doctors are going to confirm their worst fears. That, you know, you know I don't, if I don't go to the doctor and get diagnosed, then I don't have cancer, right? So there's a subset of the population of people with illness, anxiety disorder that will avoid doctors for that reason. They're, they're too afraid of getting something to confirm their erroneous beliefs. And there's a group of people within this diagnosis that will doctor shop. So there's a bit of a mixed bag in terms of behavior here. But this goes on for at least six months and it's very distressing. It's very, very distressing. And, you know, like I said, there's different behavior patterns. Some people are going to go for all the tests. Some people go for none of the tests. And the problem with the person that goes for none of the tests is when they have an actual illness, a legitimate medical condition, they still won't go for the test. They still won't go to the doctor. So in that group of people, it can be actually be dangerous, much more dangerous than doctor shopping. So if the person is worried that they're having chest pains, and it could be a heart attack. They're so overwhelmed with that anxiety that they're not going to go to the doctor. And by the time they go to the ER, it might be too late. So the avoidance because of the, you know, the fear of actually getting that life-threatening diagnosis uh, is not good either. So whether you're doctor shopping, you're wasting resources, or you're avoiding the doctor, you're imperiling your life at a later date probably. Uh, so this disorder can be very significant, cause significant distress over time. Illness anxiety disorder used to be known as, still, I always call this hypochondriasis, right? That's how it always was. Now the DSM said, we don't like hypochondriasis, even though it's been called that for forever. We're gonna call it illness anxiety disorder. Like I said, I, I have no idea what these people did when they wrote the DSM-5. They just, I don't know, they had, a, they had to sort of justify why they're getting paid and why they're doing this. And so they came up with new categories that were not necessary. But illness anxiety disorder is the new version of hypochondriasis. You also have physiological disorders, um, psychophysiological disorders. They have been renamed as psychological factors affecting medical conditions. So that's the new label. They've always been known as psychophysiological disorders. These are disorders in which there is a physical basis for the disorder, but it's made much worse by stress, um, psychological factors in general. So this could include um, high blood pressure, hypertension, Hypertension is definitely something medical related, but it can be 
aggravated a great deal by stress or poor, uh, poor coping mechanisms, poor emotion regulation, you know, coronary heart disease as well. There's another one that falls, asthma is another disorder here where it's made much worse by stress. So these are medical disorders that are exacerbated by stress and they give you hypertension, coronary heart disease, and they give you uh, asthma. These are all three, there's, there's, there's several other ones as well, but these are three major ones that you see. They're medically based, they're organically based, so there's a physical problem, uh, but they're, ex they're exacerbated, they're made much worse by the medical or psychological, or by, actually by the psychological problems, the stress, the poor coping, the anxiety, etc. Then you have the immune system being regulated by the brain, by your psychological state, and th this field is very, very important, very important field called psychoneuroimmunology. It's the relationship between stress and infection. And we know that chronic stress suppresses the immune system, and that's a bad thing. And it suppresses it over the long term. So if you're worried about being sick, and you're so worried that you're ultra stressed, you're actually making yourself more sick by constantly worrying about getting sick. And that's a lesson that many people need to learn pretty fast. You wanna stay healthy? Don't stress over getting sick. Because during the, the stress response, the immune system, well actually during the infection response, the immune system prevents, uh, destroys, identifies and destroys antigens, which are foreign invaders. So they can be bacteria, um, they can be viruses, right? They, these are foreign cells that do not belong there. And the antigens, right, represent immunity. So basically they're, they're chemical compounds developed in the immune system to fight against the bacteria and the viruses. And most of the cells that deal with this immune response are called lymphocytes. They're white blood cells that circulate through the lymphatic system and they attack these antigens, these foreign invaders, these pathogens, bacteria and viruses, and sometimes cancer, certain types of cancer cells that can be suppressed early on, on, right? They get labeled as dysfunctional and then the immune system destroys the cancer cell. Uh, but, but mainly we're talking about uh, foreign invaders like bacteria and viruses. And some of the cells, uh, some of the lymphocytes that actually destroy these cells include the helper T cells, the natural killer, the natural killer T cells, right? And then the B cells. So they, they affect um, whether there's immunity being developed to a bacteria or a virus and which cells will actually attack, physically engulf, uh, phagocytosis, eat the, uh, the, the antigens, the foreign invaders, the bacteria and viruses. They can actually be engulfed, basically swallowed up by the white blood cells and basically stop the infection that way. The problem is that stress compromises the system and so if you're chronically stressed and you have poor coping mechanisms, your immune system is going to be very much underwhelming. It's not going to do its job. It's not going to effectively fight against these pathogens, these bacteria and viruses. And so a lot of people are very stressed about getting sick. And that chronic stress about getting sick is going to actually lead to a higher probability of actually being sick. And that's one thing we know for certain. So the best way to avoid an infection of any kind is to keep your stress levels down. Obviously, you know, you want to eat healthy, you want to exercise, you want to keep the stress levels down. And so the immune system is working at optimal capacity. In this country, though, uh, with stress always so high, chronically high in so many people, the immune system is not optimal. And the weakened immune system may not be able to fend off the, the invader, whether it be a bacteria or viruses. And the reason why the, how the stress, uh, the nervous system leads to, um, affects the immune system is through the release of norepinephrine. So stress lead, leads to the sympathetic nervous system releasing norepinephrine and the endocrine glands secreting steroids, corticosteroids. 
And those corticosteroids inhibit, over the prolo prolonged release of corticosteroids and norepinephrine, actually inhibit the immune system from working properly. This is the chronic stress response. This is not like just a temporary stress response that is adaptive. This is people that are chronically stressed, like a lot of people in the world, right? Chronically stressed every day, things to worry about, can't sleep properly, don't eat properly, don't exercise properly, uh, constantly stressed, their immune system is shut down because they're constantly releasing norepinephrine and corticosteroids because of the stress response, and that chronic activation will suppress the immune system. And then combine this um, chronic stress suppressing the immune system with chronic stress leading to poor behavioral changes, like I mentioned, not sleeping, poor eating, lack of exercise, smoking to deal with the stress, drinking to deal with the stress. These all diminish the immune system. So you're trying to remain healthy and you're so worried about getting sick that you're engaging in all these poor behaviors. And these poor behaviors along with the chronic stress is inhibiting the immune system and it's actually making you more likely to get sick again. So there's good coping mechanisms and bad coping mechanisms. Unfortunately, alcohol consumption, drug use is a, a very well known poor coping mechanism in the US. And that directly is going to lead to suppressed immune response. So it's ironic that people are so afraid of developing an illness that their behavior and their stress response, you know, ironically leads to a poor immune response and makes it more likely to actually develop the illness they're terrified of getting in the first place. So that has to be changed. That, that should always be addressed in that, someone that's undergoing chronic stress. And of course, personality style as well. So if you're a more opti optimistic person, you have a positive outlook on life, you have constructive coping skills, so you're able to more effectively deal with stressors in your environment, and you're also resilient. You bounce back from trauma, you bounce back from difficult times. These people are have better immune function and they're able to fight off illness. You know, also if you have social support, you have friends and family, you have people that care about you, you have people that are you know, worried about your well-being. Uh, that's going to help as well. So it's good, you know, it's very important to maintain contact with people during times in which you're very stressed because that's going to offset the role that stress is playing on your immune system, that negative role. People that are more lonely and have less social support, they have a poorer immune response. So reach out, contact people, contact friends and family, stay in touch, be supportive of, of everybody else, right? Do not isolate, do not, you know, become like a hermit, you know, stuck in your apartment or your house and not going anywhere. I mean, yeah, sometimes you can't go anywhere, right? So right now we're not going anywhere, but it's important to reach out to people. Don't just, you know, leave your friends and family behind because this will, this will help you with, you know, whether or not you're susceptible to illness. It also increases the recovery from surgery which is an interesting fact that this, this social support can boost your um, recovery during some difficult surgeries as well. So there's a lot of factors that are involved in the immune response, but stress is a major one of them, right? And how you deal with stress, whether you have social support, whether you have an optimistic personality style, or you know, you're able to cope effectively versus ineffective coping through alcohol and drugs, uh, which tends to be on the rise in society. People are using alcohol and drugs to self-medicate because they're so stressed and they're just suppressing their immune system to the point where this is going to make them more likely to get sick. So it's having the opposite effect of what they're trying, you know, what they desire to happen. So that's it for somatization. I hope you enjoyed. It's a pretty long read for me, but there's a lot of information here. Uh, feel free to email me or come to office hours or whatnot. I hope you enjoyed it. I'll see you next time. Okay. Bye-bye.